so without further ado, I would like to invite um, Dr. Elizabeth Croft, Vice President, Academic and Provost of the University of Victoria, up to the podium to introduce our first speaker. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being here. Thank you, Erin. And good morning to all of you who have joined us here today at the Legacy Art Gallery. I would like to echo Erin in acknowledging with respect the territory and the peoples whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. It is a great privilege for me to live and to work and to play in these lands. And I give thanks uh, to those who have stewarded these lands since time immemorial. And I am so delighted to be here today to present to you Dr. Anne Diamond, recipient of UVic's 2023 Distinguished Women's Scholars Award. For almost three decades, the Distinguished Women's Scholars Award has highlighted and honored outstanding research and creative achievements by female identifying scholars. The University of Victoria has long demonstrated its commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion by actively fostering a culture of diverse scholarship. UVic stands out from many post-secondary institutions across Canada due to its composition of its leadership. At UVic, a significant majority of the executives and deans are female identifying individuals with a notable representation of visible minorities. The diverse composition of UVic's leadership understores this commitment and makes UVic a dynamic place to teach, learn, and work. And actually, it's just a bang up team, I can tell you. They totally rock. And on to our speaker. Dr. Diamond is an associate professor of art history at the University of Lethbridge. She is also a program advisor to the Art Canada Institute's Changing the Narrative for 21st Century Fellowship Program. Her 2019 book, Diversity Counts, Gender, Race, and Representation in Canadian Art Galleries addresses the gap between equity mandates and actual practices at Canadian art institutions and makes a plea for more conscious, equitable curating. This work is an outstanding research achievement and has had visible impact on the research about women artists as evidenced by the notable increase in exhibitions dedicated to women artists in art museums across Canada. We are so delighted to have Dr. Diamond join us today and I know many of you are looking forward to the roundtable discussion happening later. So thank you all so much for attending today and please join with me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Diamond and congratulating her. Thank you so much, Dr. Croft. Um, how's the sound? Should I, should I step away from the mic and speak loud or lean into the mic? I see the comment. Probably for the recording, it's better if it is. Um, I do just want to clarify um, I, the, the introduction would have been written some time ago, and I am no longer affiliated with the so much. Um, reasons may become clear later in the talk. <laughs> uh, so hello and thank you for that kind introduction. I am honoured and humbled to be here in the lands of the Lithuanian peoples. I'm an Anglo-Irish settler descent, living and working and doing this research in Treaty 7 territory, the land of the Blackfoot people since time immemorial. And I hope that this work is in some very small way useful in decolonization and reconciliation. I too have to start with some thanks um, thanks particularly to Miguel and Shannon Lake and all of the staff for the gallery, as well as staff at the university who've managed so many things behind the scenes. Um, thanks too to Linda Gammon for this art, which raises questions about how collections and art history is shaped for future generations. And to Dr. Carolyn Benedict Butler Palmer for organizing this fantastic exhibition and symposium and with the Department of Art History and Visual Studies, and call it the Department of Art History. To the Department, um, with, and Chair Erin uh, Campbell, um, and the support of Dean Lindgren for putting my name forward for the Women's Scholars Award. Um, 
I do have imposter syndrome. Um, I'd also like to thank the provost, Dr. Croft, for supporting this series dedicated to platforming the work of women scholars. As I hope my research shows uh, today shows, this is still necessary. And I hope you'll forgive a slightly longer set of thanks because there are a surprising number of people associated with Victoria that are part of my history. Without Professor Catherine Harding, I likely would not be an art historian. A long time ago, I took an intro survey course co-taught by Catherine and Carol Gibson Wood, also associated with UVic. Truth be told, I was in pre-med and mainly took it because I'd heard it was an easy A. Um, and by the end of term, I nervously asked for a meeting uh, with Catherine. Uh, I had never spoken to a professor before and said something to the effect that um, I really love the course, but you know, like art history, it's not a job, right? <laughs> and with her characteristic dry wit, Catherine replied, well, it's my job. And that literally changed my life. So thank you for that intro course, Catherine, which opened my eyes in so many ways. Um, and serendipitously, the other bookends of my formal art historical training, my PhD supervisors are also here. P Professors Patricia Layton and Mark Antliff were such an essential part of my growth. Both Mark and Pat taught me so much about art history, but also about good research and good writing and professional practice, for which I will always be profoundly grateful. I can't look at them or I may cry. Um, I'm, sh <laughs> I'm showing an earlier, oh, am I, am I showing anything yet? Here we go. I'm showing an earlier work by Linda that seemed apt. Um, I basically show charts and I try to so show some not charts so that the art historians don't get too agitated. Um, for me, one of the great questions in academic practice, in activism, generally in life, is how social change happens and how we can move the terms of debate in this, museums have long confounded and frustrated me because on the one hand, from the emergence of museum studies as a serious field of academic study in the 1980s, the role museums play in perpetuating deep cultural inequities has been central to academic discourse. That is, we have understood their structural role and we have critiqued it. And on the other hand, pretty much everyone I know in the Canadian art in museum world is broadly speaking, a good person. That is not obviously a racist or sexist dinosaur. Some people are making faces. <laughs> and yet things have been slow to change. We are people in systems and changing the system is hard. So in what post COVID may seem like an optimistic uh, position, I started thinking about and hoping in the power of rational arguments to move people. More than a decade ago, I started thinking that quantitative data, not common in our field, might be one tool in the change arsenal. Long story short, in 2019, I published an analysis of Canadian arts institutions that used both qualitative and quantitative data to look at equity in Canadian arts museums. Oh, here we go. Um, and I looked at the period then from 2000 through 2010 I limited the study to solo exhibitions of contemporary art. For consistency across institutions, I defined contemporary art as artists alive at the opening, and I assessed gender and race racialization from publicly available information. That is to say, I did not assign gender or ethnicity. I found that data on websites or elsewhere. Um, at the time I began the study in 2011, presenting gender as binary was common in English, uh, but we, the students and I, were paying attention to gender, gender identities. Um, of the nearly 5,000 exhibitions that we studied, only one in that initial study was by an artist whose gender was not identified in a binary way. Um, and that was from a small institution that didn't actually meet the criteria for inclusion, so in the end was not included in the data set. No artists were identified in other, any other way than male or female, if they had been, we would have counted that. This too tells us something important about what is, in Linda's words, latent, hidden, invisible. So I ended up assessing 97 Canadian art institutions, that's almost all of them, and more than 4,500 exhibitions. In this first talk, half of my talk today, I will be focusing on living artists and assessing gender and racialization from publicly available data. Before this project, like many of you, I was wary of quantification and where it might lead. 
I don't, I didn't, and I don't make a conscious habit of slotting people into categories, although the data might make us all wonder about the extent to which we do that unconsciously. Despite my discomfort, the project seemed necessary, and it showed pretty conclusively, I think, that the more important the institution, the more likely it was to be significantly gender biased in its solo exhibitions. Overall, female artists were significantly less represented in the country's art exhibitions, but the most significant thing to me was that the big galleries tended to be a lot worse than the overall average. That is, smaller institutions like this one were making the numbers look a lot better than they were at the really big institutions. So what we see here is a list of the institutions that were the least gender equitable within my criteria. And you'll note that the National Gallery, which I will spend a fair bit of time talking about today, is right at the top of the list. That is the bad end. Um, can, I, can I be so judgmental? I think I can. Um, the column you'd likely be most interested here is second from the right, the percentage of female artists, in, and that's living artists in solo shows. I, I don't say that every time. Um, the chart is organized by statistical probability, but to my utter shock, most art people aren't that interested in p-values. Um, so you might be surprised that the UBC's Museum of Anthropology was ne next, and then the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, I spent a lot more time on the places that seemed most inequitable, so I don't actually have very much data on Victoria. The Art Gallery of Gre Greater Vic Victoria in the period showed fewer artists than male, but not by a statistically significant amount. That it is, it was statistically equitable. Well done, Victoria. Um, I found that most people, myself, myself included, immediately come up with reasons other than bias to explain or minimize these numbers. A common mitigating response to, uh, was to position gender bias as an artifact of historical forces. Things are getting better, right? And so I looked historically at the National Gallery and found that in terms of gender equity and solo exhibitions in the 1970s, there were zero f solo shows of female artists. So that column for 1970s is there. There were none. Um, in the 1980s, the decade when w women working artists surpassed 50% of the Canadian artist population, female artists had just over 20% of solo shows. That ratio ro rose to 31% in the 1990s. And I have to point out that in France, in the early 1800s, the most prestigious art exhibits in the world were then held at the French Royal Academy, and their numbers from the early 1800s hovered around 20%, occasionally reaching 30% female. Um, that is, it was working as equitably as France 150 years earlier. At the National Gallery in the 2000s, the ratio actually dropped. It was lower than in the 1980s, and the data is clear that female artists made up more than 50% of the working artists in Canada since the 1980s. That is, by the 2000s, they would have been at least reaching senior levels, and their re representation at this key gallery got worse. A cautionary tale, for sure. My data doesn't get at why this cultural stagnation happens, but of course, it's related to what Angela McRobbie has described as the sense that, we're, that we were in a post-feminist era or Susan Douglas's term that we had fallen for the seductive message that feminism was done. I certainly felt it in the 1980s. I felt that gender bias was a thing that we, we had made great stri strides on and something that I would not be subject to. And then I got work. Anyway, no, <laughs> I suggest that this uh, sense of progress can sometimes be a form of culture-wide gaslighting, which the more theoretical in the room might see as the enduring power of hegemony. And for an example of this, we might look to uh, the recent Barbie debacle, and I want to give a shout out to Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig. Um, Barbie was robbed, but yay, Lily Gladstone, I guess. Um, so to bring it up to speed, the 2010s did rebound, although I fear that showing that decade in this chart makes 38% artists gendered female feel like something to celebrate, and I really don't think it is. <clears throat> Some art relief from the charts. Before I get to the National Gallery's recent changes, I want to look a little at the idea that hiring female curators or racialized curators necessarily results in better representation. And I want to discuss this two ways. The first is more qualitative. 
Back in 2013 or so, I interviewed a couple of dozen curators from across the country and started asking whether they quantified things in their institutions in their own heads. Essentially, did they know their data? And I was speaking to a curator who had, a lot of, who had shown a lot of female artists and who I assumed was working from an equity-based activist practice. And she answered, as most did, that she did not believe in quantifying and that she didn't know her numbers. She asked what they were. Um, and I told her that she had curated more than 60% female artists and her eyes widened and only half joking, I think, she said, oh my goodness, don't tell anyone, that could ruin my career. <clears throat> The half joke, this, so this was in 2013, the half joke re reveals a truth. There are many pressures on curators, and I'm not sure how fair it is to look at the records of particular curators. We don't know what their directors are calling for, what their exhibition committee is consistently refusing. But of course, on the other hand, not quantifying leads to real gaps in the data, but to blind spots. Um, and so I, I try to tread a balance here between not calling people out, not calling out individuals, because as I say, the problems are systemic. Um, I only could look at the data on one institution's records. Um, many institutions don't name the curators for all their shows. Um, and so uh, I'm not naming this gallery because it would reveal the people. Um, at this gallery, which shall remain nameless, but I did name in the book, um, the solo shows of living artists curated by male curators from 2000 to 2010 on the left were actually more gender equitable than the shows curated by female curators on the right. They were, the female curators were really gender inequitable, uh, only 80% uh, 80 male. Um, that is to say, both my quantitative data and my qualitative data show that the curator's identity alone is not going to fix this. There are too many other factors, maybe the individual curator's beliefs, but also their in institutional empowerment and the overall institutional politic. A disempowered person from an equity-deserving group may actually be less able to curate equitably for all sorts of career reasons. That is to say, it's, a, it's about a lot more than getting better representation on staff, although goodness knows we need to do that too. It also takes institutional support. So uh, gender was my initial lens. That's where I was in 2011. Um, but I considered the ethnicity or racialization of artists in more limited samples. Um, it's a little harder to track, and I'm a lot less comfortable doing it. I again looked to publicly available sites to see if artists were racialized. Um, at that time, and I think this has changed somewhat, almost nobody was identified as white or settler. I don't think any in my data, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, so culturally, in museums and elsewhere, where uh, it was common to leave as unmarked the category of Caucasian and mark most racialized people in some way. It's, I don't feel like my numbers are as solid, but you know, that, that is true. So looking at the big galleries in Toronto, I don't think anyone was surprised to find that exhibitions of living artists at major Toronto galleries were significantly white, as shown by the large swaths of blue here. But just how white surprised some people and I don't have the data to track if it was only white people who were very surprised. Um, this played out differently in Vancouver. Um, and I want to be clear here that I am not calling for quotas, although people often assume that that's my goal. For me, it's useful to know what the population makeup is. And here I've shown it on the left. I'm showing you the, uh, using the terms from Statistics Canada, um, showing you the province and then the city of Vancouver. Uh, and and essentially the, the statistical data, the city is about 2006, I think. Um, to me here, the question is really about what you would consider equitable, what fair would be. In one conversation, and I actually think it might have been you, Carolyn, joking around like 20, you know, a long time ago, um, but it might not have been. Um, a colleague uh, had said with respect to that question, like what would fair be with respect to indigenous representation? What about if we use the est our estimate of the population numbers of indigenous peoples if settler cu culture hadn't tried to eradicate them? Right? Um, and use that as a benchmark. A more conservative answer is quite often, well, the general, um, the general population isn't the right benchmark because you should look at the population of artists. That's what statisticians typically say. Um, but there's an obvious problem with that, right? Because then you only replicate the current system. Um, I'm not sure where equitable lies, and thankfully, I don't have to make those decisions. 
but I know that this isn't it. So, um, uh, I, I realize this is sort of old data now, and I'm trying to, okay, I, I'm gonna hit the mic because I talk with my hands normally. Um, okay, um, if you wanna update the, the gender and racialization data at the National Gallery in the next day, decade, um, that is from 2011 to 2020, their gender balance improved to 38.8%, which I said earlier, but the ratio of racialized artists actually fell. And in 21 solo exhibitions in that decade, only one went to a racialized artists. Now, there are reasons for this, reasons that the data doesn't get at. The curator of indigenous art at the National Gallery was very concerned with curating group shows in that decade, um, and he did important work, so they don't show up here. But this is still a valid metric. And also, there are other racialized groups that would not fall into that category, um, but it still shocks. The National Gallery is unusual in that it had three female directors for most of the time from 1966 to 97, and that was quite rare in that time period. But from 1998 to 2019, that is most of the time I looked at, it had two male directors. As I said above, I'm not sure a person's gender or ethnicity is the most significant factor. Um, and in 2010, the National Gallery director, Mark Mayer, was interviewed about the institution's lack of diversity and publicly said, we're only interested in excellence. We put what we find in the Canadian art scene that is excellent and we are blind to color and ethnic background. Or even whether you were born in Canada, we don't care. We're looking for excellent art, we don't, we don't care who makes it. You might note here that the questions around inclusion didn't even include any discussion of gender, which for me is important. Um, however, obviously there are other problems. Um, so we might critique his stance in some quite theoretical ways, relying on a critique of objectivity, which I think is important to do. Um, but for me, the quantitative data might be the clearest way to critique this. If you're exhibiting less than 5% artists of color in Canada in 2010, or even 38% of female artists in the 2010s, I think you have criteria that you may not be conscious of, that may relate to the artist's body rather than their art. Quality is obviously essential, but there is superb art being produced by people of all identities across this country. And as I say, I'm not arguing for quotas. For me, the data, the facts, are a starting point for analysis. They are a tool to help us mitigate what we all have, that is, limitations and biases. We are human, we have biases. And if we don't know the numbers, we are for certain underestimating or overestimating our representation if we are from a dominant category. Other people do that research, not me. Um, okay, so since the book was published, I've lamented all the things that I didn't do in the study, as well as data I can't get access to. And so here I wanna um, acknowledge some of my limitations. I haven't figured out how to quantify uh, sexual identity in any way that feels verifiable. Sorry, I'm, and I, by that I don't mean gender. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to look at uh, queer representation, but it's not something I, I can do yet. Um, I'd also love to be able to look at economic privilege, and believe me, I would if I could. Um, and there are also obviously limits to the use of counting. There are ways to be included, for example, that are problematic and that a mere count doesn't capture. But when your count captures that you're showing 5%, you, you know, to, sure. Um, so, but I, so I've been arguing that quantification gives us a baseline, um, and I've documented many places where the rhetoric can be really good. The institution might be saying the right things. AGO. Um, but then when I turn to <laughs> look at what they're exhibiting, it's, as we say in Alberta, a place I don't normally identify with, um, it's, uh, as we say, all hat, no cattle. Sometimes, on a personal level, we might feel that equitable representation has been reached. We might feel that there are a lot of shows right now of certain populations. And for me, quantification is useful for that, too. There's research going back to the 1970s in all sorts of areas that look at things um, and show that what the dominant culture feels is equal is in fact overrepresentation. Sorry, I have a bit more theory, but I'm just gonna wing it here. Um, I wanna give a shout out to all the girls who had She Talks Too Much written on their report cards in grade school. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, right? Like if you're from an underrepresented group, um, sorry, the data also interestingly shows that even if you are from an underrepresented group, 
you have also normalized the representation of dominance, right? So even if you're from an underrepresented group, you probably think, oh, there are a lot of whatever shows right now. Okay. Um, for me, it's the data that helps me quantify that. In some of more, my more recent work, I've started looking more closely at acquisitions, um, which, like exhibitions, are a key component, component of curatorial work. Acquisitions are key to breaking the pattern of unrepresentative and consequently untruthful histories of art in this country. Like, it's not just that it's representative, it's that it's bad history. Um, it can be challenging because of the sheer amount of data to look at acquisitions. Big institutions acquire a lot more art than they have solo shows. Um, and also acquisitions are a, a harder to um, feel certain about. There are so much takes place behind closed doors. Um, there are many factors at play for curators and institutions. Opportunity, budget, dedicated funds, um, the delicate art of courting donors and their predilections which skew racist and sexist, um, generally, not to mention those of directors and acquisitions committees. Many things are outside of a curator's control and my data can't quantify. The fact is, for galleries across the country, acquisition budgets are very, very small, and most institutions rely primarily on do donations, and that fact has important impacts. Um, I'm gonna focus on a gallery that does have a major acquisitions budget and that is extremely important in Canada. Here you go, people. Um, in terms of collections, it is arguably the vault we most need to crack. Um, and any analysis of acquisitions, sorry people, there's some policy talk. Um, any analysis of acquisitions must consider an institution's mandate and related acquisitions policy. This gallery's 2013 policy, still in effect, begins with the oft-cited institutional mandate set out in the Museums Act, and it, it directly follows that with the statement that the gallery acquires important works that will build on strengths and fill gaps in the collection. It has said that since, I think, the 1980s. Um, filling gaps seems key to the issues at the heart of this symposium. The policy nuances the various collecting areas, and I highlight the final sentences on contemporary Canadian art, which state, diversity in every aspect of the term remains a significant priority. And the next sentence then singles out one kind of diversity, do I have that? Um, regional diversity, which makes me wonder if the gallery has ever tracked its acquisitions with respect to any kind of diversity other than regional. I suspect historically they have not. Um, I know, but not by someone who's on paper or on record. Um, for me, our collapsing of diversity into regional representation has been a persistent Canadian trope that we see repeatedly. So the policy continues to the international contemporary, adding that they will also make a special effort to acquire works by major, major artists from regions of origin for new Canadians. So aware of this policy and mandate, let's turn to its acquisition record. Um, I'm showing here a slide from Joyce Seaman and Amy Wallace's important article, uh, Where Are the Women?, which showed that in 2010, female artists made up only one-third of Canadian artists whose work was acquired by the gallery that year. Worse, this ratio remained pretty consistent since the 1990s. That is, similar to my data on solo exhibitions, Seaman's showed that gender equity had not improved, it had stagnated. <clears throat> so what happens when we update the account accounts again? Um, all right. uh, I've pulled data from the 2015-16 annual report, um, and I will eventually extend that, but it's, it's a slog. Um, so uh, whether we look at the gender of artists in the left column or the total number of works in the right column, in both cases, the results were very similar, still around 70% male. And so this is all acquisitions, including historic, not just contemporary. Um, still stagnating in 2016. In the next slides, I'll continue to use solid colors to represent the number of artists and pattern fill to, to represent the number of works. Spoiler alert, it turns out that it matters. Um, <clears throat> because the, N the National Gallery has an acquisitions budget, I was able to compare donations and purchases because I heard repeatedly that acquisitions were skewed by the interests of collectors, and they are, um, and the wider male bias in the commercial market. Um, the often unspoken implication of this is that purchases are not so inequitable. But when we break down the acquisitions by slide, by purchases and donations, oh, where am I? Okay. 
Um, here, it was the donations on the far right that were more equitable than the purchases. I expect, I think I know, that the bigger sample I'm working on from institutions across the country will show this year as an anomaly. But for me, the key issue here is that the acquisition bias in favor of males at the National, uh, National Gallery is not only a donation problem, it continues to be a purchase problem. Um, although I'm not showing it here, this tracks with my pre preliminary results elsewhere. Okay. Um, for me, the key here is the stickiness of that overall 70% male, or male identifying, um, so similar to Zeeman's data from a previous century. Okay. So when we compare the ethnicity or racialization of artists whose works were acquired, the column looks remarkably similar to the gender ratios. The large blue bar represents unmarked or white artists, racialized artists in green made up only 30% again of the artists whose work were acquired in 2016. If we drill down in that category, as the breakout column on the right shows, the majority of racialized artists whose work were acquired were indigenous, 11% um, making up, 11 artists making up 21%. The majority of these were Inuit, um, and I don't have the data here yet about the number of works on paper, but a high proportion of these are prints which might lead us to other considerations. Um, print works on paper are generally less expensive is what I'm implying there. Um, both of the black artists whose work were, works were purchased that year were international, not Canadian. Um, and observations like these that arise from the data can point us to further research that needs to be done. That is, does this track over a longer period? Are we only investing in big stars who are racialized? You know, there's, there's some interpretive questions there. Um, so this one year sample shows significant improvement around acquisition of indigenous artists, which was necessary and long overdue. But the data is also suggestive about the representation of artists from other equity deserving groups, which I think are just starting to be taken seriously as an issue in many institutions. So I'm showing this uh, same info in a different way here. This, art, this chart is sort of more intersectional, let's say. Um, we see here that white males made up 50% of the artists whose work were acquired and white females 20% in this year. Racialized males made up 22%, but those with the double tax of being female and racialized made up only 8%. I, I'm, I'm feeling some like uh, trauma in the crowd. It's like, it's a bit painful to study, I have to say, it was, it's, it's tiring. Um, Worse than tiring. Uh, I've been talking about non numbers of artists, but we look at if we look at the number of works instead, the picture looks really different this year. And of course, I want to not show you the data when it when it shows better things, but I am a scholar and I cannot do that. Um, in 2016, the gallery purchased 145 prints by Robert Davidson, and I note media is another category we might want to study. As I said before, sorry, works on paper are shown less, cause less. Um, so here. Uh, Works by white males are down to roughly a quarter. Works by white females at 11%. Um, works by racialized females make up a larger portion, but the category of racialized males, works by racialized males, is up to 46% because of those Davidson prints. Another way of interpreting this is that both white males and white females basically got cut in half, um, uh, and racialized peoples went up. Um, essentially doubled from the from um, earlier records. But that basic gender ratio remains the same. Males still make up more than 70% of the acquisitions. I show you this to point out the data is neutral, um, uh, but of course data can be used to represent less fully, so I'm always trying to get multiple ways of considering the data. For me, number of artists and number of works is actually more robust, um, and, and so better better research. In 2019, the gallery underwent a change in leadership, and the new director, Sasha Suda, led the development of what was called the gallery's first ever strategic plan, which cited a long overdue need to prioritize diversity. 2019, it was late to the game. Um, and so I thought it would be useful to compare acquisitions before and after. My earlier research, particularly on the Montreal Museum of, in of Fine Arts, indicated how important a director could be in terms of what exhibitions are greenlit, and I expected this to be even more true for acquisitions. So if we compare the gender of artists whose works were acquired in 2021, 22, 
there's a significant change. We went from less than 30% female to just slightly more than female artists shown in, orange, shown in orange. And I, of course, try to present this data neutrally. But um, <laughs> if we consider racialization, there are similar shifts towards more equitability. In 2022, the overall percentage of uh, artists from racialized or equity-deserving groups has almost inverted the 2016 numbers, and you know you get a second year for that. Um, racialized artists here made up more than 65% of the artists whose work was acquired. This is a major accomplishment, and I expect that it comes out of an intentional process that we might see as activist that has been called activist. How do curators find donors that are willing to collect art from underrepresented populations? How do they pitch acquisitions that might be by artists the board is not already on board with? Um, I can't highlight how much work I expect went into this. To, for, these core, for these curators to be able to shift so significantly, and so this is both donations and acquisitions, right? Um, I think it implies some pent up demand on their parts. Uh, and I want to go back to the idea that the previous director um, had suggested uh, that he only saw quality. Um, when a director speaks like that, it makes the curatorial job almost impossible um, to move the needle to advance these issues. I see this as really meaningful change. It allows not just a more equitable history, but a more truthful history which I will keep coming back to. Um, but before our party gets too wild, I have to point out that one year's acquisitions uh, do not meaningfully fill the gap, to quote the acquisitions policy. And I wouldn't want us to think, job done, decolonized, patriarchy defeated. <clears throat> and so I turn to look at a slightly more complicated picture of number of works acquired, particularly with respect to gender. Here, the number of works acquired is still more than 70% by male identified artists. Oh, and I don't have slides yet. Um, if we look at purchase, sorry, does that make sense? So I'm comparing 2015, 16, and 2021, two there. Um, I don't know if I want to talk much about, and I don't see a clock. How am I doing for time? You, Oh, okay, and then I won't. You know, st there's still a purchase program. Um, um, oh, then I got tons of time. Oh, you, <laughs> I have another half hour, sorry. I, um, do I want to? Well, I, th I actually don't think I need to talk about this one. Um, basically, there's still a donation, pro there's a donation problem, and there's still a purchase program. So. This is a kind of myth in the curatorial field that like we're beholden to the purchases, right? Or I mean, we're beholden to the donations. There's like, well, if your purchases match them, you know, and I know it's more complicated because sometimes you're purchasing things because a donor, you know, you're purchasing things in concert with donations, but let's, okay. Um, when we look at these in a more intersectional lens, as I had done earlier, um, it's clear that gender is a compounding factor. Works acquired by female identifying artists are still less than one third of works uh, acquired. Here, racialized females work is 19%. Works by white or unmarked females is down to only 9%. I've mentioned some limitations like sexuality and class that I'd like to be able to quantify but can't given the publicly available data. The most important though might be financial information. How would this pie chart look if it showed dollars spent in each category? I can't access this data um, but as I said, when I gave this information at the National Gallery in December, um, if you're in a leader posi leadership position in the National Gallery, you can. And in case it's not obvious, I think you should. Um, <clears throat> I was quite nervous when I said that. Um, it's not irrelevant that the National Gallery had major personnel changes in the wake of these changes. This is not easy work. Sasha, Sasha Suda, who seems to have been integral to these changes, left for a position in the United States and two really significant curators were fired in the wake of it. It, it remains, and, and um, I don't have access to the information behind that, right? I'm, I'm not um, speculating about why they got fired. Uh, it re remains to be seen what the data will show about how these personal, personnel shifts track with the numbers in the long term. So because this quantification of inequitability can be so painful, um, looking at some of the really good things that have been happening at other institutions um, uh, is something I felt I had to, to uh, do in the second or third part of the conversation here. Um, 
so um, I wanted to show some museums, some of the changes that can show, uh, can make a difference in collections, in exhibitions, and in our ability to tell more accurate histories of art. I almost decided not to talk about the Art Gallery of Ontario at all because of the turmoil of these last days and weeks. Wanda Nanabush, the first curator at the institution whose position named Indigenous art as a responsibility, recently left the institution for complex reasons, and we can, and I, I, the, I not, which I'm not qualified to speak about. Um, this loss still feels very raw. Uh, and the news broke yesterday that Takralik Partridge, an associate curator of Indigenous art who focused in on, on Inuit art, had also left. Um, I think it's really important to look at the significant changes that have been visible there in recent years and to not, not discuss it, which is what I actually wanted to do because it feels very awkward. Um, so I'll start with a kind of baseline. Um, the solo exhibitions of living artists. Um, so, yeah. Um, we're looking at solo exhibitions of living artists from 2000 to 2010, and you can see in that first decade that I tracked that institution, it was 86% white and 67% male. Um, I don't have a pie chart for the next 10 years, but if you look at the next 10 years, those numbers really start to move down to only 57% male and 65% white or unmarked. So, Nana Bush was hired in 2016, um, and I know you can't read this, don't worry. Um, Nana Bush... <laughs> Nana Bush was hired in 2016 as an assistant curator of Canadian and Indigenous art. And in 2017, the next year, the person who was essentially her boss, the, the curator of Canadian art, Andrew Hunter, unexpectedly resigned. He published by far the most outspoken criticism of institutional culture I've ever read. You should look it up. Um, uh, it's called Why I Left, Why I Quit the AGO, I think, if you Google it. Um, the same day as Hunter's explosive letter appeared, the AGO announced a revised department structure, a newly parallel Department of Canadian and Indigenous Art that would be co-led by newly promoted curators, Georgiana Oyarek, uh, who became curator of Canadian, and Nana Bush, now a full curator of Indigenous Art. Um, in those interviews that I talked about, I interviewed a lot of curators, and almost none of them said they counted. One exception was Georgiana Oyarek. She said, yeah, I know exactly what I've been doing, and I have been actively curating and inserting women into the conversation whenever I can because what because that is a contribution I can make. Okay? So that kind of structural empowerment is really key to change. So this is, as I say, the didactic at the start of the Canadian um, section. And the reinstallation of uh, essentially the non uh, Ken Thompson collection of the Canadian section in 2018 has a number of moves that indicate really significant shifts. First, I'm indicating here that the texts are all in at least one indigenous language here, Anishinaabe Moan, um, but other languages uh, as appropriate. To me, this feels a little more performative than some of the other changes that I'll talk about. But of course, the performative also has a place. Visitors don't see the structural empowerment of specific curators, but they sure see this. Um, I'm hoping you can read the detail on this one. Uh, which references their working process and grounds that working process in treaty rights and treaty obligations. The references to good, the, necess the necessities of good relations seem especially important um, and ironic at this moment, um, but I'm trying to suggest that equitable collections, um, for me, what, what stands as proof of good relations is actually the cattle is, is backing up the data, right? With, with numbers of, of works included and shows. Um, they've moved to a completely thematic installation. There's an overt, overt rejection of chronology and Nana Bush and Ulyarek explain that they see this as indigenous centered and thus non-chronological, setting aside the idea of linear time. And I'm quoting here from uh, this and other sites. They say chronologies favor Eurocentric art histories that erase and exclude indigenous understandings of art and time. Now I'm not sure I'm totally there. I feel myself resisting and, and I feel when I'm critiquing so many other people that it's useful for me to put that on the table. 
Um, uh, for me, that is a useful experience. It reminds me of that oft-quoted passage of Foucault's, I'm sure you all know it, who quotes Borgia and describes a classification system that is not his own. And I always think Foucault, do you know what I'm talking about? Kind of gets, no, yes, at the back, do you know? Oh, I, okay, sorry, I'm gonna give, I, I, I didn't write it down, but um, Foucault's a famous theorist, I'm looking at some particular faces um, who I spoke to yesterday, uh, and he describes sort of reading this, this categorization and it's, it's crazy. It's like cows, dogs, cats, animals that are painted with a fine camel tooth brush and other, like it's, it's an, to him an irrational classification system. And he, he says that when we're confronted with a system, a classification system that doesn't make sense to us, he says, the thing we apprehend in one great leap is the limitation of our own system of thought. But of course we mostly don't. We mostly go, wow, that's nuts, right? Um, and so, when in this non-classification system, non-linear classification system, it is challenging to me, right? But hopefully, we can take that from Foucault and say, maybe there's a rationality, maybe there's something that I am not. This is not my classification system. It's not what feels natural to me. Of course, what feels natural is cultural, right? And so, that confrontation is really useful. <clears throat> So here, we're looking at works by Norval Morisot and Carl Ray in the Orange, Origins Gallery. Um, other themes include the self, land, water, storytelling, transformation, and indigenous to indigenous. <clears throat> I'm really interested in didactics, people. Um, didactics, that's what we call all the labels, right? Um, uh, so I wanna read that last sentence. The AGO exists on Anishinaabe land, and so we begin these galleries with Anishinaabe stories. In every room, works by indigenous artists are present and significant, and in most, the terms of relations between different communities is made palpable. Female artists are also quite visible. Um, I've gone, I've tried to count, and I've gone and photographed twice, but like somehow it's impossible to be sure you got every single work in, in all those galleries. It's like a really big gallery, and I guess I have to employ a student to I don't know. Anyways, um, so I don't actually have the, num the, the breakdown of numbers on either of these, but it is radically different than previous installations. Um, <clears throat> uh, here, we're looking at Kathleen Munn's fam farm animal paintings, um, and, sorry, and the label says, um, her work is unlike anything else being made in Canada at the time. It goes on to do a quite traditional art historical thing. It talks about the formal qualities of the work, but then there are these moments where you hear a curatorial voice, which I also find really important. Um, the last sentence is, the explosion of orange near the center of the canvas that represents the cow's backside is especially delightful. I don't know why I found that label so delightful, but I really did. Um, uh, we might find Marion Dale Scott's works, uh, or here we find, uh, Marion Dale Scott's works, and here I want to note the final sentence. Throughout these galleries, works that are of known locations are named and related to their treaty status. So here, in case you can't read it, um, it reads, Jojage, Montreal, lies within the traditional and sun unceded territory of the Kanyakahage Mohawk peoples. Um, I'm not sure what this does for indigenous youth, for example, but when I was there last summer, there was a visible presence in the visiting population of indigenous people. And I was really struck by it at the time. I'm not sure I had ever been in a gallery and thought, wow, there's a lot of indigenous people here. Like maybe in this, I live in Southern Alberta, right? So when I go a lot to the National Gallery and a lot to the Art Gallery of Ontario, but those, you know, that is, doesn't feel like the normal, I mean, we, there are visitor surveys. We could do these, this, we could quantify this. I think I'm, you know, it seems to have opened the doors in ways that I think are important. Um, okay, I mentioned earlier that we were looking at the non-Thompson collection, um, and I used to find the installation of the Thompson collection infuriating. For me, and so uh, this was a major gift that the Art Gallery of Ontario acquired. Um, it's, it is the biggest, the biggest collection that was ever given to a gallery in Canada, um, but it came with a lot of strings. The, the um, owner said it had to be installed, you'll see some installation shots, with essentially no text, 
no labels. He just wants the art to speak to you. Um, for me, art presented with no context is the height of insider baseball. Um, and I don't know if that's the right comparison <laughs> of exclusion is what I'm saying. Um, but there are many formalist institutions that don't get my goat quite as much as that. And then a curator there told me that there are more than 2,000 objects in the Thompson collection, of which four are by female identified artists. In fact, it's only one female artist because all four are by, guess, Emily Carr, correct. <laughs> um, right, okay. Um, so I, uh, I understand, I guess, that to get this collection, they had to acquiesce to his terms, install it in his way, but this points to some of the immense, and this points to some of the immense pressures that galleries face with respect to donors. Um, but now, in response to the other non-Thompson Canadian installations, I've kind of warmed to the idea that there might be a, a use for the sharp contrast between installation styles. I don't think you can walk into this and not go, wow, do they not want me to understand this? Like, it's one thing for those of us in the room, right? But if we think about the public, it's a really different experience. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, you know, I think it even leads people to wonder about how collections are built because the signage is so clear about the donation. Um, I think it's even a harder ask of institutions um, to make clear the relations between indigenous peoples in the European galleries, um, but they have also done that at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, and I show you who, here the inclusion of Kent Monkman, who sometimes feel like, feels like every curator's favorite artist, um, is really visibly present. Um, artists that make art about collecting fit the narrative well. Um, so, but more than that, this does some other things. It is a strategy of rejecting a strict chronological division. Most of the European is still relatively chronological, but the chronological is, is disrupted by the contemporary. This has been an important practice in institutions for, I don't know, 15 years, 10 years now? Maybe not quite 10 years. Um, it does a bunch of things though. For me, most importantly, where collections are not deep or are even non-existent, it allows representation. Object-based museums for too long have believed that they didn't have the object, they couldn't tell the story. That is, when we haven't been collecting in, an are in areas, there's nothing we can do about telling those stories. The place that I think this feels most obviously problematic is when we think of something like uh, Southern US plantation house museums, right? For a long time, they would say, well, we can only tell the story, story of the plantation owner. We don't have any records from the enslaved people, so, we can't tell that story. And this is another strategy for us, like when you kind of go, yeah, that's obviously wrong. It can lead you to the critique of the other, where that happens in other places. Um, uh -uh. It makes, so it also makes space for other viewpoints. Um, so you're not only hearing a curatorial voice. That being said, they don't shy away from didactics. And here we can read the text. Sometimes it feels a little heavy handed to me but the idea that we start addressing the relation between the economics of colonialism, the economics that underlaid the European art, um, and North American and South American uh, and the Americas is really important. I'll just add the economics of patriarchy is not yet something I've ever seen addressed in a gallery. Um, one of the other strategies that's now become clear is getting the support of donors. Um, when I interviewed curators there in 2012 and 13, one of the things they mentioned repeatedly was how much the gate, the entrance fees, mattered. One even said that basically, if you couldn't relate a show to the school curriculum and get buses of students coming, you would never get traction for an exhibition, which boggles the mind, right? Um, and since then, they've initiated several special funding groups. That is, they are naming that donation problem and not trying to hide it. Um, and sh I'm showing you here the Women's Art Initiative at the AGO, a significant fundraising drive centered around building the collection. I mentioned right at the beginning that for smaller institutions, relying on donors is a problem, and this combats it in two ways, both financially, but I think also really importantly, it um, is a way of educating donors about the problems that they are uh, uh, involved in. 
Um, in similar ways to the institutionalization of an indigenous position and to the funding of the Women's Art Initiative, although there is no, of course, women's art curator, um, they've also looked to improve their record on African and African diasporic arts. And here I show you a piece that works as a tangible connection between the collections. Jose Campeche's uh, was of Afro-Caribbean ancestry, and they describe him as a descendant of the African diaspora, which might be um, missing some key words there, but I'm not sure because he was in Haiti, like one imagines descendant of enslaved peoples, but they don't state that. Um, here he's painting the saint who invented the rosary. Who knew that was so, such a recent thing? I don't know. Um, and the text panels link the same forces of colonialism that brought Campeche's forebears to Puerto Rico, as well as introduced Catholicism to the region. And they go on to say that it allows us to think in brand new ways about the history of European art and its reception around the world. Right? So it's tying together really complex social forces in ways that I think are important. In 2020, they created a new Department of the Arts of Global Africa and the Diaspora, and they promoted Julie Crooks to curator. Um, they announced a new support, uh, su a support group called Friends of Global Africa and the Diaspora, which has several prominent b female board members on it. Um, and this kind of structural change that comes with funding is the only way I think change really happens. <clears throat> in 2022, we also saw new interest in equity around representing queer and 2SLGBTQIA plus lives openly. Of course, art galleries have always exhibited queer people. Um, uh, queer people's work, I should say. <laughs> That's a different kind of art gallery. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, and, um, uh, I think I think that lags behind somewhat. It isn't yet worked into the structural changes we're seeing elsewhere. <clears throat> and so I, I come to my conclusion. Um, the work museums do is so important that it needs honest analysis, even when it is difficult. Um, I presented some of this info at the National Gallery's uh, on the National Gallery's recent acquisitions last month, which I have to say felt pretty brave. It is hard to say to an institution, this is not good enough. Um, but I'm motivated by the fact that public art galleries are our galleries. They are our institutions and, and worth fighting for. Um, we are all impacted, as I've said, by preferences that are conscious and bias that is unconscious. This, we can't change. But we can work to continue to mitigate it, as clearly the National Gallery did in its 22, uh, 2022 acquisitions and the AGO has been doing in the last few years. If institutions want to do what their mandates usually require, that is to tell truthful histories of art production in our country, um, or as the National Gallery's acquisition says, to fill gaps in the collection and prioritize diversity, the recent shift towards more conscious, consciously equitable practice must accelerate. Comprehensive data helps us know where there are more gaps to fill. I want to address the issue of categorizing this, as is so often done, as activist collecting. Is it useful to think of the National Gallery's uh, 2022 work as activist collecting? In many ways, I know it was. But it was just barely equitable in terms of numbers of women. It was not yet equitable in terms of numbers of work, and I would assume quite inequitable in numbers of dollars spent. Curating equitably should not be conceived of, uh, as activism. When I ask, will it become a baseline for competency? I started with the cautionary tale that solo shows got less gender equitable in the early 2000s at the National Gallery. And to me, this warns that unless we're actively quantifying things, unconscious bias may lead us back to the problematic norm, and that there is a real danger in refusing to acknowledge categories of difference that are still relevant. Data is the best mitigating factor we have to confront our own unconscious biases as well as those of others. Thank you. To ask questions. And thank you so much. That talk was just fantastic. Yeah. It's really got me thinking about many different things. And the data. What a lot of work.
I know the data is really boring for like the art community. There are <laughs> more charts, and like I'm not very good at graphic design. But, like, <laughs> the Excel chart, yeah. Thank you. So, you know, so I actually have a website that the round picture, the one that had the round pictures is a website, but I like keep not actually making that website public. Like it's, it's weirdly challenging, right? And so I am planning to get a, like a rolling five year average is what I want. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Karen. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, so um, uh, Michael um, Miranda at York has done some really good work on uh, finan like st financial statistics. Um, it's a slightly different methodology, but he has done some of that work. Um, I mean, for, because I'm sort of, because less smaller institutions tend to be more gen, gender equitable. And sorry, maybe I can address that a different way. I'm not sure I can answer your question, but I have things to say about other things that are related. Um, <laughs> uh, so we looked, we also looked at things like public galleries, university galleries, and artist run centers. And guess what? Nothing is surprising there. Artist run centers are the most gender equitable. No one was surprised by that. Public art or university galleries I thought would be better than they were. They were closer to the public art gallery general than to the artist run center. So artist run centers are, and you know, I know I'm talking to different levels of people in the artist. Artist run centers were often exhibiting lesser known artists. It's often, they, they used to be their own separate thing. Now they're kind of like a career stepping stone to the big leagues or something like that. And I think we get, we construe this as a pipeline problem, right? That artists who don't have ec the economic ability to sustain Precarity over a long period of time, that was an awkward way of saying it, um, drop out of the field, right? So we don't get the uh, deep practices is a, something we always hear. You know, we can if we look at Norval, we were talking about Norval more so earlier. I mean, that's someone who may work over a really long period of time, lived in a very precarious way, and some of his late work is fantastic when we know he was really, you know, living on the streets of Victoria, right? So, you know, I, I, the pipeline issue is real, it is, but it, it can also be like, I'm sorry, if you're saying in 2020 at the National Gallery, the pipeline issue for women is the problem, like, you know, I, that's the field I know best, so that's what I go to, but it's true of all the fields that there are people making excellent art. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I, and I'm not a museums person, so I don't, how do we need this many of this artist and this many, you know, like it, you know, the stacks of, of, anyway. We do need depth in the collection, but that, so I don't think that quite answers your question, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyone else have any? Alan, yeah. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the thing, people don't normally cite making, making their mark, making our mark. Um, what they often go to is the Gorilla Girls, right? Um, and that, that's, I found that a response often, oh, you're like so 1980 feminist, which I guess maybe I am. You know, it, I found that really interesting. But I guess for me, the question there is, there have been these groups, and you know, if we go to the States and look at um, New York in the 60s, uh, AIR, the, um, the Artists' Rights Collective partnered with women artists and 
artists of color, black artists, um, and then the women left the group, right? But they were collecting statistics and arguing for change in MoMA, and arguing for inclusion in MoMA. The terms of debate were so different then that it wasn't, you know, the term, I mean, they really did say things like, well, women artists don't have to support families in the 60s. Like, I think that was part of MoMA's response to the presentation of the statistics. Um, I f so the, st the statistics are interesting because in some ways you can't refute them, but they also, for, I'm, I'm not sure where we land there. Um, I'm not sure that people who believe that we should show all of one category don't still believe that for some other reason. For me, I feel like there's something about the shame of them now. Like we're certainly in a moment where even if you believe that, you should feel some shame, I think, around that. I don't know. So yes, there is a history of that. I'm not sure the history has led to the change that I maybe naively believed that it would. That would <laughs> I think I'm not, yeah. Does that make sense? Is it, or is, is that not what you want to mean? Is, are you thinking of something else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that, you know, that's super. That's super interesting. And I have not been a party to that kind of thing. Although we are seeing social protest now, big social protest. I think around Nana Bush's departure from the AGO, um, and I, I think that will continue to accelerate. I guess the Aboriginal. Uh, collective, Aboriginal art collective, curatorial collective, sorry, thank you, uh, just just released a, a new letter, which I think is fantastic. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I mean, it, yeah. 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 So, I mean, I'm at the beginning of the acquisitions research, um, and so I, uh, and and the data sets get really huge. Like, I think it was about 2,000 works in um, one year at the National Gallery. So like it's actually really time to me because you can employ students to do it, but then you have to double check everything if you're if you want to say it publicly, right? Um, so yes, I think that's a really important thing is is the artist donor because often those donations are coming in in relation to a show or in relation tied to someone else's donation, right? I, yes, I absolutely think that's important. The Davidson, I don't think were donated. I think they were all just acquired. That's that is one that I had pulled out, but. Um, I will track that yet. I am not. I can't speak to it yet. Is what I'd say. But but yeah, I think it's a really key thing. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. I read a really interesting, and I I think you played the Ben Meyer a number of years ago at UBI. So thank you for your time. Um, full circle. Uh, I am thinking right now about you know um, if you think about gallery exhibitions and things like that, and it makes me wonder about fan action efforts. I, do, I would love to, but I would also love someone else to take up that project. <laughs> but yes, yeah, no, I mean, I do, because of course that goes back to Carolyn's first question, right? Like if, like if you're not getting the funding to make the art, it, you know, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great um, thing. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the scholar who did. There is work on 
the Canada Council grants. Um, for a while, they had an Indigenous targeted acquisition budget. And, and I doubt this is still the same, so that would have been in the early 2000s. And I heard someone at UAC presenting on it saying, um, you could track that there were a lot of acquisitions and then as soon as that funding, that targeted funding dried up, the acquisitions stopped, right? So, I mean, surprise, surprise the money matters, right? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, super interesting. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see that. Yeah, I, I, um, when I started teaching 23 years ago, I do feel like there, like there were a lot of people who were very anti-didactic, right? That, that, that were, and that it sort of comes around in contemporary galleries regularly, like the, the Southern Alberta Art Gallery um, in the town that I am has moved away. They only have didactics outside the room. Um, uh, because they really want you to experience the art. Like I'm not in, I, 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 you, I'm here in this context, and yet I feel like I am not an art person. Um, like I don't necessarily get art, um, and I think that's why I study it. It's like, oh, that's weird. It, the whole thing is weird. Um, so for me, the didactics are really important, and I do feel like an outsider, which I know is ridiculous. Um, you know, so like. When I go in galleries and I, or I talk to people, you know, when you talk to the general public and they're like, you're in art, like, uh, you know, there's, there, it, like, I think we in the art world could do a much better job at making people have ways into the art. I don't mean that, you know, explaining it so that they have no physical response in front of it is the way, but I think there are ways to allow people access to have an artistic and aesthetic experience. So I so I love didactics. I read them all. I am you know I take I take pictures of them all. I took one of the. There's a really good didactic over here. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I mean I I feel like we've moved. There's a little bit of a uh, almost. It's like our culture in general. We are polarizing, is what I feel like. You know, there seem to be these places that are doing way more didactics and also a re retrenchment of the purely formalist. Um, you know I. I find the didactic successful. Maybe, arguably, with phones and everything and QR cards, we've moved to a place that the didactics don't have to be as present. But I'm I'm not sure how where you're like yes they do, I, yeah because I, I think most of us don't like using our phone in the QR code. It, to me, it speaks to accessibility in all sorts of ways, right? But the question that, like you were talking about writing them, like how do you hit it right so that it doesn't feel heavy-handed to people who already know something about it and doesn't condescend and, you know, uses language that the average person can understand? I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenging part of the job. And that's in 75 words or whatever the word limit is that you're working. It's, it is really, I mean... I hope it didn't seem like that I don't have a deep respect for what curators do. I, I absolutely do. And in particular, the balancing of that with the courting of the donors, right? Like, if you do want to be educating, and yet you still have to follow the money, this is a tough job. So, yeah. Is, is, oh, I, I was going to say, is it time for drinks? But <laughs> No, no, I, I, I love to discuss. I'm so happy to have you here. Well, I, I share with you a discomfort about the information technology in the curious sense. I mean, there's a loss there too, right? Yeah, no, I, 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 I think there's a 
think about this in terms of concepts that we challenge. And so we're working through an extent to me that what it wants to do is to create a community that's going to be very much more cohesive and more European mm -hmm. and settler culture, but to bring a, a, a Latin that, you know, the Hanistatian culture is there. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to make that. So you get to say that indigenous people are living in a Tango era. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing a French anthropologist in the fifties where the intrepid mariner is bringing the whole galaxy through um, you know, foliage and saying that every state they're they're approaching uh, you know, I don't know the difference in the French is the given um, a group that was just a day there and um, he said with every step we're going back a thousand years. Right. <laughs> and right. people like, oh really? Yeah. So in other words they're not alive at this moment mm -hmm. and you are and yeah. we're not Whatever their way of life is, the yeah. social, the anthropological, and the planetary. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really quite puzzled by all that. And mm -hmm. one thing when you take the chronology out of it, I'm very picky with the uh, geo ladies, the planner, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. and But you also see in the chat and comments that they're very modern. And is that the really important thing in that photograph frame? Mm -hmm. What is seen to me is somewhere mm -hmm. what kind of parallel in other words are you left with when you don't acknowledge mm -hmm. um, the different moments of history that have created a very modern conference there? Yeah. Um I don't have a text thought for that, but the, the tent movement in that room is uh, a work called the Deluge. Um, okay. so so, right, which and it um, and the didactic does not make explicit reference to the deluge, the idea of a deluge cross-culturally. Um, deluges are part of, uh, you know, uh, Judeo-Christian traditions, um, Greek traditions, have, you know, it's, it's a, uh, but part of, uh, you know, I want to say Anishinaabe Malin also origin stories, right? The tent um, So the, the text panel there is a bit subtle, I actually thought, because it does sort of require you to extrapolate. And if you didn't have that knowledge about the Judeo-Christian tradition of the of the um, deluge, the, the flood, you might not be able to. But there there is a really cross-cultural blending there that I actually think is important. I don't think it's just that they're large, but it, that, that to me that one really works. Um, you know. I, ha I also have pictures of people looking, I take pictures of people in galleries, um, looking where you think, oh, they, they are having that experience of why is this here, right? I think that is a challenging part of that installation, that question of why is it here? That's maybe why I liked the um, Campache, who wasn't an artist I knew before I went to that gallery, because it, the, the didactic talked really clearly about this person was brought here because of colonialism, and it's, I think that uh, it d maybe there or in another panel, it directly addresses the relation between them that I think is important. I think it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. That's what, you know, and, and as I say, uh, I experience the world chronologically. I think about everything <laughs> in that way, right? And I do think there's a loss. But of course, there's also something gained. I mean, we could talk about the Tate. The Tate reinstalled everything thematically, right? In when it did its reinstall, it wasn't done from an indigenous way, and I'll be honest, I hated it. I hate, I don't like the way they reinstalled because you know, like I'm really attached to the chronology, but I'm one of those people who's like pretty actually comfortable in an institution as it turns out, despite my outsider status. So yeah, I I think it's yeah there it's it's really a challenge, right? yeah. and I don't and I don't deny that you're looking. Mm. Oh, the uh, yeah, the and the mm -hmm. yeah, the Alan de Yeah. Sorry. 
A place where I thought it was really challenging, and I don't have slides in this particular um, set of slides, uh, was the Rembrandt show at the National Gallery, which I did not see in person, but um, it really reframed Rembrandt and all of the Dutch masters um, in terms of the uh, incredible wealth that was coming into Europe in that time in relation to colonialism. It was really powerful, and and they included many contemporary indigenous works in the Rembrandt show. I didn't see it, but uh, you know, from the didactics around it, super interesting. So. Yeah. 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 And. Uh, yeah. And the, you know the Johannes Fabian was that was a, the, a book called Time and the Other that looked at Pat citing a, a, a scholar who looked at how old museums, particularly anthropological museums, situated indigenous peoples in a timelessness, right? Um, and how time as a construct can be used to to other populations. And I do, I do think that's a really important. I don't feel that in the AGO, but I understand, like I do understand what you're saying. And as I say, I'm not, maybe I'm not the right person to speak about the value of the thematic, because it isn't my way. But I do think disrupting my way is useful, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Right. And well, and the National Gallery has really had that problem, right? And the AGO would too, that they just weren't collecting anyone else in those time periods. So what do you do? Do you just say, okay, we can't tell those stories? And you know, it is a creative intervention into that that I think is working. Yeah. Are, are we ready for drinks? <laughs> I, I really just mean coffee and tea, people. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. I <laughs> well, thank you all for coming and listening so attentively. I appreciate it. Thank you.